on this Wednesday night. We're very concerned about him. A Canadian still in custody. China won't say where he is or why. He was so devoted to his work. Every day he wanted to learn more about China. As tensions rise, concerns tonight about a second Canadian. The parliamentary party does have confidence. Yeah. Theresa May survives a revolt from her own party, but with her power weakened, where does that leave the battle for Brexit? Everyone was screaming, we're stuck. We can't get the two of them. And she survived a plane crash, got passengers to safety, and as the only flight attendant on board in Fonds du Lac, she's telling her story only to CBC News. This is The National. Michael Kovrig might not be the only Canadian in trouble in China. The former diplomat was detained there on Monday. Retaliation, in some eyes, for the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Tonight, a new worry. A second Canadian whose whereabouts are unknown. As Katie Simpson tells us, right now, Ottawa has more questions than answers. If Canada's troubles with China weren't already enough, the Foreign Affairs Minister is dealing with a new, urgent concern. A Canadian in China reached out to the government after being questioned by Chinese authorities and hasn't been heard from since. We are working very hard to ascertain his whereabouts and we have also raised this case with the Chinese authorities. Tonight, Ottawa confirmed that missing Canadian is Michael Spaver, an Alberta entrepreneur living in China with close connections to North Korea. He's known for facilitating meetings between Kim Jong-un and athletes, including the NBA's Dennis Rodman. Canadian officials don't know where he is, nor do they know the whereabouts of Michael Kovrig. A Chinese spokesman says the NGO Kovrig worked for isn't authorized to operate in China, while a state-run newspaper claims he endangered Chinese national security. This isn't the first time Canadians have faced these kinds of allegations. We're very well. Very good, thank you. Kevin Garrett and his wife Julia were living in China and carrying out charity work when they were detained in 2014. There was a really extreme psychological pressure yes. and the flights are on 24-7 and the interrogation is very intense and lasted six hours every day. They're calling on Ottawa to be proactive in resolving this case while urging his family to stay calm. These countries, two countries trying to solve a big thing is going to take some time. And I think just take a, just take a big breath and, and be patient. That may be easier said than done for Kovrig's family and friends. But he was very, very dedicated. He was so devoted to his work. Every day he wanted to learn more about China and he was so friendly to anyone he encountered. Security has now been increased at the Canadian Embassy and consulates in China, a move that comes as the government acknowledges an anti-Canadian sentiment is developing in Beijing. Canada is demanding officials be given access to Kovrig. They want to see him in person, hear his side of the story, before deciding if they'll formally call for his immediate release. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the government is also addressing today its role in the arrest and possible extradition of Meng Wanzhou and whether Canada has become a political pawn in a feud between two superpowers in their high-stakes trade negotiations. It is ought to be incumbent on parties seeking an extradition from Canada, recognizing that Canada is a rule of law country to ensure that any extradition request is not politicized or used for any other purpose. Christia Freeland again putting the onus on the Americans to treat the extradition as a purely legal process. Donald Trump suggested yesterday that Meng could be used as leverage in trade talks with China. Today, his Justice Department nicks that idea. What I do, what we do at the Justice Department is law enforcement. We don't do trade. We are not a tool of trade when we bring the cases. In terms of the law, Canada didn't really have many options when it came to Meng's arrest. Ms. Meng, Canada has a duty to do what we did so far, which is to arrest Ms. Meng 
because the U.S. made a request under our extradition treaty for a provisional arrest. But it doesn't mean Canada's hands will be tied as the extradition plays out in the courts. So the treaty doesn't actually oblige Canada to extradite uh, full stop. It obliges us to enact a full legal process to go through that process and to exercise our obligations to our treaty partner in good faith. And Canadian extradition law allows for a number of outcomes here, uh, some of which may result in extradition, some of which may result in extradition being declined. In a statement today from Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, she says the decision to extradite will ultimately be hers if the courts approve surrendering Hmong to the U.S. And if this case keeps getting political, that may be a valid reason to not hand her over. Now, the U.S. has until the end of January to make that formal request for extradition. Then Canada has a month to get the proceedings underway. In the meantime, Meng is settling into her life in Vancouver, where she's already become something of a neighborhood celebrity. Maybe I should take a picture. Is she in there? All right. This home is where Meng has to live for now. Under her bail conditions, she'll be under guard and confined to the house overnight. News photographers caught a glimpse of Meng today waving goodbye to visitors from the Chinese consulate. And someone inside the house must be trying to make friends in the media. A Domino's pizza delivery was sent to the front door and then over to that gaggle of reporters out front. Coming up, deficiencies, inadequacies, and racist attitudes. We have the details and reaction to a scathing report on Thunder Bay's police force. Plus, changing the intersection where 16 people were killed in the Humboldt crash. Could new safety recommendations prevent more fatalities? But first, British Prime Minister Theresa May gets another shot at Brexit after surviving her own party's confidence vote tonight. This has been a long and challenging day, but at the end of it, I'm pleased to have received the backing of my colleagues in tonight's ballot. While tonight's win is a clear majority, a significant minority, one third of Conservative MPs, voted against her. As the CBC's Nala Ayad tells us, that internal party struggle will be a real challenge for Theresa May as she tries to build support for her Brexit deal. In trying to tear itself away from the European Union, Britain has been tearing itself apart. Absorbed for months in a political drama that just won't let up. Preparations for today's episode started early. The Prime Minister vowing to fight the challengers within her own party. I will contest that vote with everything I've got. By stepping up to lead a disunited kingdom, Theresa May took on an enormous job. Improbably, she survived a disastrous election, awkward negotiations, and now in the final bumpy stages of steering Britain through Brexit, an attempted coup. We will therefore defer the vote. It came together after May blinked earlier this week when it was clear her Brexit plan would be widely rejected in Parliament. 48 MPs submitted letters to oust her. But I felt it was time for a new leader. The challenge unleashed an uproar in Parliament today. Ahead of the confidence vote, as added incentive for those who were hesitating, May vowed to step down before the next election. The parliamentary party does have confidence. 200 MPs voted to stand by her. Whilst I'm grateful for that support, a significant number of colleagues did cast a vote against me and I've listened to what they said. So while the mini civil war is over, the insurgency lives on. The Prime Minister must realize that under all constitutional norms, she ought to go and see the Queen urgently and resign. But with the vote behind her, May goes back to Brexit business, its uncertainty as well as its dangers. Will she now put this deal before Parliament and halt this escalating crisis? With the help of those Tory rebels, her Brexit plan may still be defeated. It may well be that when the vote arrives in the House of Commons, whenever that may be, in whatever form that takes, she may find it increasingly difficult to bring those people on side. So, as the political drama gripping this country shifts away from one cliff's edge, it could well be making its way straight towards another. This day, no doubt, leaves Theresa May weaker and closer to being out that door. 
The continuing uncertainty will keep her distracted as leader, but it's become a familiar posture. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. So she may have survived a no-confidence vote, but Theresa May has no time to waste. That Brexit clock just keeps on ticking. So let's sketch out what could happen now. So the next step for May, get enough votes to pass a deal by the January 21st deadline. That means ringing concessions from Brussels, MPs opposed at home, or both. And they may decide they have no choice given the alternative, which is no deal. It's entirely possible the clock runs out. May puts a deal to a vote and it dies. And on March 29th, Britain staggers out of the EU. Trade and transport barriers slam into place. Markets swoon, unemployment soars. Fair to say no one wants that. Of course, the UK could ask for more time, but the other 27 EU members would need to agree, and publicly at least, they're not keen. There is another way, though it's unlikely as long as Theresa May is Prime Minister, a so-called people's vote, a second referendum to go with an existing deal or to stay in the EU after all. Like, all this never happened. Indigenous people in northern Ontario have been saying for decades that the Thunder Bay police force is rife with racism. Today, a groundbreaking report said they are right. Overall, I found that systemic racism exists in Thunder Bay Police Service at an institutional level. The acknowledgement drew a standing ovation, and Ontario's police watchdog said the problem runs right through the ranks. Some expressed very disturbing views. His team reviewed 37 police investigations, all involving Indigenous deaths. He said because of discrimination and a lack of training, officers didn't take basic investigative steps, even ignored evidence. At least nine cases were so problematic, he said, they should be reinvestigated. In all, the report issued 44 recommendations, perhaps most telling that Thunder Bay's entire police department be peer-reviewed by another force for at least three years. So how are Indigenous people in Thunder Bay feeling now? Karen Pauls has that story. Yeah, I'm just over in this tree over here. When Brad DeBungi visits this spot where his brother Stacy's body was found, he says a prayer and offers tobacco as a gift. You come here, what do you think? How do you feel? Frustrated. <laughs> Angry. You know, how, how could somebody do that to another human? Stacy DeBungie's case triggered the systemic review. Just 25 hours after his body was found, and even before an autopsy was complete, police ruled his death was non-criminal. And I don't believe the fact that they said that he rolled in the water. I think there's foul play there. These waterways are known as the River of Tears because so many Indigenous people have died here. But there is some hope that this report will be the impetus for change. My cousin was murdered here. Joyce Hunter's cousin died after he was attacked during a visit to Thunder Bay last year. She says police still aren't communicating adequately with the family. His mother lives on a remote First Nation and dreads coming here. To her, this city represents, it represents death, it represents pain, it represents suffering. She doesn't feel safe here. Today, Thunder Bay's new police chief accepted one of the report's key findings. Barriers do exist within the police. No, I'm, let me talk. There are barriers within the policing um, service, but also systemic racism, yes. The lawyer representing the Debungi family and their First Nation says there can't be any more delays. If after three years they have not complied with the recommendations, they ought to be disbanded. Back at the Riverside, Brad DeBungie hopes his brother is resting more peacefully now. His death may have some purpose, but only if things actually change. He and many others will be watching. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Thunder Bay. This is the now notorious intersection in Saskatchewan where 16 Humboldt Broncos team members were killed in a bus crash. But that intersection could look very different in the future. The province has taken a hard look at it, trying to figure out how it can be improved. And today we saw its plan. Olivia Stefanovic takes us through it. 
the magnitude of loss is still felt here. The report examining the intersection doesn't ease anyone's grief, but it does attempt to prevent more tragedies from happening. Scott Thomas watched the news conference. He lost his 18-year-old son, Evan. To have the government acknowledge that some things can be done to make it safer, um, just kind of put a little feeling of resignation in your heart saying, yeah, you know, it could have been safer. The report does highlight a number of safety concerns, including obstructions to driver's vision. The fixes? A consultant recommends the removal of trees, installation of rumble strips, larger stop and stop ahead signs, wider shoulders, and a safe access to the memorial. A recommendation was made to install rumble strips after a family of six was killed in 1997, but the province didn't act. Would rumble strips have helped? I would think rumble strips would have helped. This time, the province is listening, accepting all 13 recommendations from the report at a cost of approximately $1 million. But it requires all drivers to pay attention to what they're doing, follow the rules of the road. Um, and if drivers don't do that, um, we're still going to have accidents. Just Kirat Singh Sadhu, the driver of the semi the Broncos bus collided with, was new to the job and the territory. He's now facing dozens of charges, including dangerous driving causing death. Scott Thomas says there needs to be a federal standard for truck driving training. They're dragging their feet on that. It's only going to make things safer if everybody's trained to a minimum standard from Victoria to Halifax. It's, it's got to be done. Until that happens, families wait for action and answers. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Toronto. Now this Friday, we are expecting the Transportation Safety Board to give its recommendations about another deadly crash, one that happened last year in Saskatchewan's far north. West Wind Flight 280 went down just after takeoff from the Fonds du Lac Airport. That's at the northern end of Saskatchewan, almost at the border with the Northwest Territories. 22 passengers and three crew members were on board that twin turboprop plane. Everyone managed to escape, but a few were seriously hurt. Also, a young man did die later in hospital. And for the lone flight attendant, whose quick actions are credited with saving lives that night, the memories are still fresh. Tonight, she's telling her story only to CBC News, and she is our witness. I used somebody's cell phone and I called 911, and I said, my name is Jenny Tate, I'm the flight attendant to board Westman Aviation Flight um, 280. We just got airborne from Fond du Lac, and we've crashed, and we're stuck in the aircraft. While we're trying to kick this door open, taking turns kicking this door open, I just kept yelling, remain seated, because everybody wants off that plane, but if, like, there was nowhere for us to go. I think that there was 17 people that I evacuated from the aircraft and um, then I like then people were like there's people that are stuck in the front. I maintained a very calm and authoritative manner the whole time because the passengers they look at the flight attendant and if they would have saw me stressing out or panicking then that would have caused them to panic. So I, I remained calm and authoritative the whole time so I'm really appreciative that that now it's being recognized of what I had done that night for them. Still ahead on the national changing the stigma by changing the language as the number of deaths by drug overdoses continues to rise the movement to shift how we talk about drug use takes off. Plus meet Aiden Anderson your new prime minister just for the day though. Can't wait. And the Canadian who's building a game-changing battery. Why this invention could change the world. It is science in service of society. And maybe, maybe that was the Canadian piece, that we, we just said, this is a noble enterprise. If you had any doubt about whether Canada's opioid crisis was getting better or worse, the latest numbers tell a big part of that story. It is still out of control. More than 9,000 people died between January 2016 and June 2018. 17 people are hospitalized a day for opioid use, and that's a big jump, almost 30% over a five-year period. Now, there's lots of talk about how to turn things around, but there may be another side to it we don't often consider, that to turn things around, we need to change the way we talk. 
Christine Birak explains what I mean. Drug addict, abuser, getting clean. Most people don't think much about what those words mean or imply, but for Amanda Dick, they meant she didn't deserve help. People haven't become any more sympathetic necessarily towards the plight of people with substance use disorder, so it's still very shameful, and I think a lot of people are very hesitant to seek help and treatment because there's this perception that you're a bad person. And that's why those words matter. Dick's fear of becoming an unworthy stereotype prevented her from getting help or even talking about her opioid use with friends, family and co-workers. At that point I was absolutely terrified <laughs> that anyone would ever find out. It's entirely possible that in the future our children or grandchildren are going to look back and you know, be aghast at how we've treated people who use drugs. Despite the fact that addiction is a disease that chemically alters the brain, the word addict is associated with a Latin myth about a slave who is set free but chooses to remain in chains. Other phrases in the English language that we use with the term abuse, child abuse, spousal abuse, animal abuse, elder abuse, in each case the thing in front of the word abuse is who or what is being harmed. But when it comes to drug abuse, who or what is being harmed? Certainly not the drugs. Medical professionals like the doctors and nurses here at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health are leading the way with language that puts people first, dropping words like addict, abuser and clean, and simply treating patients who have a substance use disorder and their test results are positive or negative. But some say changing the larger conversation won't be easy. I've been abstinent from every drug for nearly 31 years. Sandy asked that we not use her last name. Her substance use disorder started when she was just 13. She says people judge one another and themselves. Real change depends on everyone accepting that addiction and relapsing are part of the disease and not a choice. People see it as, what did you do wrong? What have you not done right? Whereas somebody with cancer, we'd put the pink t-shirts back on, we would do the walkathons, we would, you know, um, and, and I find that very demoralizing. I was like just in abject terror. That Dick hopes speaking openly out. will help. So She's finishing up treatments for addiction and, and hopes others um, will walk through that door sooner than she did. Christine Birak, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Coming up on The National, as world leaders debated how to stop climate change at the COP24 summit in Poland this week, we bring you two stories of change makers on the ground. First, meet the Canadian who invented a battery that could make mass solar and wind power viable. And then, it started with one farmer. Now a new way to grow rice could change the way the world eats. I didn't really have much expectations. And then, you know, six weeks into the, after planting, they called me up and said, you know, this, there's a real uh, difference in the field. To waste this opportunity would compromise our last, best chance to stop runaway climate change. It will be suicidal. A blunt warning from the UN Secretary General today. This COP24 conference is supposed to be where the targets agreed to in Paris are translated into real costs, commitments and sacrifices, and talks have stalled. They're not going very well. It seems the uh, technical teams of negotiators are almost Exhausted. There are some countries that have gone in a different direction. Uh, so the United States, you know, had a cool event. Canada's Environment Minister Catherine McKenna was referring to this, a U.S. sponsored event earlier this week. Under President Trump's leadership, you know. The second year in a row, the Trump administration has promoted fossil fuels at a U.N. climate conference. Now, McKenna said that regardless of Washington's position, coal is on the decline renewables growing, but even if they could someday replace fossil fuels, there's a problem. That energy needs to be stored and current battery tech isn't up to the task. The solution to one of the world's most pressing problems might just be sitting in Marlboro, Massachusetts. That's where Paul Hunter takes us in this dispatch. Take a look around this corner and there it is. At a manufacturing plant in Massachusetts, something that just might change the world. A giant battery, big enough for a whole neighborhood and designed to be cost effective and to keep working for a very long time. I want to have a battery that's big, 
reliable, safe, and um, will deliver electricity for decades. It's the invention of Don Sadaway, professor of materials chemistry at MIT, and it's potentially the holy grail in the push toward clean energy. You have to be able to draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. And if you can't do that, then solar power is, is not the answer. Think about it. The way to truly end the need for carbon emitting power plants and embrace clean energy is to solve a key problem. Yes, we now generate electricity with wind turbines, but what about when the wind stops? And yes, solar panels now dot the landscape, but what about when the sun sets? Just as the need for power accelerates. The answer, mega batteries charged by those turbines and solar panels that can store all that clean energy until whenever it's needed such that wherever you are, the lights always turn on instantly without the need for those power plants. So this is the place? Yeah. Is, so. is this where like it began? Yeah, it's all done here. It was here a decade ago well, that Sadaway's big idea was born, a battery made of liquefied metals. Sadaway then got help from some of his students here at MIT. It was a kind of class project for the ages. His battery idea was finessed and patented, and soon enough, the world took notice. Pinned up outside Sadaway's office, shout-outs from Bill Gates, now a key investor. Time magazine named him one of the most influential people on the planet. We need to think big, we need to think cheap. He's so done a TED fans? Talk. Please welcome Donald Sadaway. And even turned out one night to chat all things battery with Stephen Colbert. Oh, and by the way, Sadaway's a Canadian, born in Toronto. He has a strong desire simply to do good. I think a peaceful and prosperous world rests on the invention of uh, modern, cost affordable batteries. It is science in service of society. And maybe, maybe that was the Canadian piece, that we, we just said, this is a noble enterprise, as opposed to, we want to do something really cool, like we're going to write an app for an iPhone. I'm not interested in that stuff. You know? This is much, much more important. The issue with existing batteries is that they suck, OK? <laughs> By They're now, really you hard. may be thinking, right. but what about Elon Musk and all the work he's putting into battery development, not least with those Teslas? Truth is, all kinds of experts worldwide are chasing the same goal. So back to the plant where they're testing Sadaway's bright idea. Everything seems geared toward keeping it simple. Am I right on that? Keeping it simple, low cost materials, uh, and then the fundamentals of the technology being a very long lifespan uh, potential. David Bradwell, once a student of Sadaway's and as it turns out, also from Toronto, now helps run the startup aimed at making and marketing the better battery. The big challenge now, proving to the world that everything works perfectly. So far, so good. See if I've got this right. It's gotta be cheap. Cheap, yes. It's gotta be reliable. It's gonna last for it's a really long last time. last for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And their big selling point, their battery will never overheat, catch fire, or explode. They hope to get it on the market within three years. As Sadaway puts it, this is not in the would be nice category. This is in the must have category. It's the answer, isn't it? Yeah. And with that, the world's power grid awaits. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Breakthrough battery tech paired with massive growth in renewables may mitigate climate change, but some warming has already happened. More is probably inevitable. 
People will need simply to find ways to adapt. Consider the stakes in Africa. Already countries there import $35 billion worth of food. If the deserts keep encroaching, if the droughts get worse, feeding people will get harder and more expensive. So tonight we're asking, how do you feed a world in climate change? There's a big idea brewing around Africa's most important grain. The proof is in all the pictures. These are rice crops and those bigger plants? In them, Jagiba Kuyate says you are looking at the future. This isn't science re-engineering rice. It's farmers finding a better way to grow it. A method with fewer seeds, less water and somehow bigger yields. To get more rice with less water might as well be magic because rice is unusually thirsty. Two cups of uncooked rice typically takes a thousand liters of water to grow. And that's a problem. In that Sahel region, the sand is voracious, the creeping desert a threat to 98% of Mali alone. Rainfall is down 20% over 60 years and the droughts are getting worse. So an idea born of inventive farmers, SRI, the system of rice intensification. At its most basic, don't cram the plants together and don't give them a lot of water. It's totally counterintuitive and totally effective. What's more, the roots end up stronger. That means they're more resilient in extreme weather. Conventional wisdom is still a, uh, that rice is a water-loving plant. It's, it's not true. Erica Steiger, an agricultural scientist at Cornell University, is the reason the SRI method is now used by thousands of farmers in 13 countries of West Africa. She heard it talked about in Madagascar, then brought it to Mali introducing it to this farmer who was willing to give it a go. I didn't really have much expectations. And then, you know, six weeks into the, after planting, they called me up and said, you know, this, there's a real uh, difference in the field. The Mali farmers started cheerleading the method, training each other and with Steiger's help, taking it to Niger, Benin, Togo and Senegal. But it's slow. Less than 5% of the rice growing world uses SRI. Steiger blames a corporate bias in agriculture that relies on selling new seeds and chemicals. SRI is basically the opposite. Farmers don't need to buy anything. They can produce with their own resources. Uh, they can improve their yields with their own knowledge. So there's nothing to sell. Some farmers are just so enamored with the process, they're writing songs about it. The man in the middle so inspired, he helped adapt SRI to wheat. And if all this is sounding too good to be true, then there are those who say you might be right. What you see here are plots that uh, farmers have cleared. At UBC, Laura Vang Rasmussen has been watching the trend towards intensification of crops, and she has a warning. Because it might be so profitable for farmers, then we actually might have a situation where it sort of like escalates the agricultural intensification and expansion of agriculture. Land cleared just to take advantage of bigger, more profitable yields. She says she's seen it happen in Laos, Uganda, Bangladesh. The concern is fair, but not for a moment does it deter the likes of Kuyate. C'est la solution à la productivité. C'est la solution au changement climatique. Si on voit la consommation de l'Asie aujourd'hui, la Chine va être dans d'ici 2050 importateur de riz. Où est-ce que la Chine va importer ce riz? C'est l'Afrique. Next on the National, a big change is coming to Ottawa. More specifically to this place. Center block is shutting down for years. I'm going to miss it a lot. I mean, I'm in my anticipatory grieving phase about this building. There are things that I, I still come in and see something new. Welcome back. Some developing stories we're following tonight on The National. Donald Trump's former lawyer is heading to prison. 
Do you feel like you were sentenced fairly? Michael Cohen set to surrender in March. That's when his three-year sentence behind bars will begin. He pleaded guilty to making false statements to the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, also to eight other counts, including campaign finance violations. Cohen apologized in court today, telling the judge his weakness was his blind loyalty to Trump. The suspect in yesterday's deadly shooting at a Christmas market in Strasbourg, France, is still on the loose, and police are widening their search. A major manhunt is underway in both France and on the other side of the border in Germany. Before the attack, the 29-year-old suspect was already known to police and to intelligence services as a potential security risk. And according to a French prosecutor, now two people are dead, a third was left brain dead, and several others were hurt in the attack. St. Michael's College School in Toronto is cancelling three of its upcoming sports programs. This a month after an investigation into allegations of sexual assault. Six students are facing charges. The school also says anyone in competitive sports will participate in workshops about bullying, harassment and abuse. And three women, sexual assault victims, are suing Alpine Canada. They're accusing the Sports Federation of turning a blind eye to the wrongdoing of former ski coach Bertrand Charret. He's serving a 12-year sentence for sexual assault and sexual exploitation dating back to the 90s. The three women, all minors at the time, are now seeking $450,000 in damages each. It is the most recognizable of all Canadian landmarks. Better than the CN Tower, I say. The center block of Parliament Hill. And soon it's going to be shutting its doors to undergo a major renovation. So much history has been made there for nearly 100 years. When you think about this room and all it's seen, these stones witnessed Winston Churchill speaking to Canadians. The stained glass windows reverberated with the voice of John F. Kennedy. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. The uh, benches upon which we lean uh, supported us through debates on repatriating the Constitution and free trade. These lights shone down on Malala Yousafzai. This carpet was walked on by Barack Obama. The world needs more Canada. This is just a room, Mr. Speaker. This is just a place. It's a lovely room. It's a lovely place. It's filled with history and stories. But this is not the center of our democracy. Democracy happens whenever MPs gather, roll up their sleeves, get to work on building a better future for Canadians. God be Well, that room is uh, going to mark another milestone in its history. Incredibly, I can't believe it myself. When the House of Commons rises for the winter break a little bit later this week, probably tomorrow, it will do so for the last time in that center block chamber for at least 10 years. So now they're talking about 15 to 18. David Cochran shows us the preparations now underway to repair and restore this magnificent but fragile building. It's not the mother of all parliaments, but it's about to undergo the mother of all renovations. I'm going to miss it a lot. I mean, I'm in my anticipatory grieving phase about this building. There are things that I, I still come in and see something new. And, As curator, uh, Joanna Mizgala is the guardian of the artifacts. Everything from the ceremonial mace to the portraits on the walls to the desks in the house fall under her care. All of it will be moved to the temporary parliament or spend time being restored. Well, it's a huge job. I mean, we've never had an opportunity to um, just turn our attention to the building. So whenever we've been able to do any work on the building, it's been either when the house is not in session or when, during an election period, but never a kind of concentrated effort on the building. Ms. Gala will safeguard the grandeur while others handle the granite on a project with no firm timeline no firm price. At this point, the, the baseline budget or schedule has not been firmly established. The heritage nature of this place makes any renovation difficult and expensive. Among other things, the center block needs to be reinforced to better withstand earthquakes. The biggest challenge is that the renovators won't really know what they are dealing with until they start. 
The original builders improvised during construction, meaning the work doesn't match the blueprints. What year we will really move back into center block? <laughs> as soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> While they sort that out, MPs will meet in this temporary House of Commons, built in the west block of the parliamentary precinct. The most optimistic timeline suggests it will be in use for at least three federal election cycles, maybe more. Well, and in fact, you can expect that there will be members of parliament who will be elected who will serve their entire careers and only sit in the temporary chamber in the West Block and never sit in the chamber, you know, the real House of Commons in this building. The idea in these renovations is to strike a balance, to preserve the ornate features of Canada's most important heritage building, but update it for modern times. When the building was built, uh, there were no uh, washrooms for women for example. Now we, that's been changed, obviously, but that should be improved. Uh, there weren't until recently any spaces for doing things like breastfeeding and looking after small children. That will take a long time. By late January, the doors will be closed to the public for at least a decade, almost certainly longer. <laughs> the carillon will still chime each day, at least until 2022 when the bells go silent to be restored. So come hear them while you can. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Definitely not enough bathrooms in that place. Renos aside, it's been quite a year in Canadian politics and no doubt it's going to be a raucous year ahead as we head into the next election. So we are bringing the At Issue panel together tomorrow for a special Q&A to take your questions. You can join all of us, Paul, Althea, Chantel and Andrew at 1 p.m. Eastern on the Nationals YouTube, Facebook and Twitter pages. But first... In case you missed it, move over, Justin Trudeau. Canada has a new prime minister, at least for today. Good morning. Or afternoon, sorry. This is Aidan Anderson, a 15-year-old from London, That's Ontario. You may think, hey, he looks a bit young for the job. But what he lacks in years, he makes up for in life experience. I've had four open heart surgeries in my life and many ambulance rides and hospital visits. Anderson was born with a rare congenital heart defect, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation made his dream of becoming prime minister come true-ish. It started yesterday with a full itinerary of official business. After an early morning meeting with one of his predecessors, he was rushed to the airport to check out his new ride. Then it was off to Rideau Hall to tour the grounds. He also took part in an RCMP hostage exercise and had some fun with his security detail, all in anticipation of this morning, when he finally took his seat on Parliament Hill, an experience he described as breathtaking. Just being in the same place that, that, our, that our founders were in, discussing how Canada is going to be a country. Just hours into his term, Anderson was already forming coalitions. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to work with your government. I'm the and as true politicians do, thinking about his next move and laying the groundwork for the next election. I'd like everyone here to please remember my name, Aidan Anderson. That way, when I run for prime minister later on in life, you can all vote for me. Thank you. Christmas trees can be expensive and not everyone has room in their budget. But a Toronto man doesn't want that to stop families from having one of their very own. And that is why he gives them out for free on his front lawn. Jesse Jow started the tradition three years ago and his spirit of giving, that's our moment of the day. This is my gift to somebody I don't even know. This is exactly why I want to do this. Um, I, just the stories you hear people who are in the city who have you know, tight budgets. It's, it's from our money, our pocket, but it's not, uh, I'm not doing it to say I don't want anything back. It's paid forward, so to speak, right? When I came, first came to Canada, Christmas was one time where I was by myself in, a, in, a, uh, <clears throat> in my residence, by myself, and everybody else went home. When I had the chance to visit somebody, I saw that they congregated around this. This is what 
kind of symbolizes a family holiday situation, you know. So a lot have gone, which I'm very excited to see because I'm getting pictures back of people who have decorated them and Christmas cards. So if we take those and put them on our tree as, you know, these are people we're celebrating um, this joyous, joyous time with them. Yeah, so they're like our, ex our extended family, so to speak. And generationally speaking, they're my, I want my kids to somehow take on a, a, a spirit of, you know, you've been blessed, bless others. Oh. Well, I love that guy. Uh, and, and we should know the reason that he he was alone in residence in universities is that he's from Kenya. And so he did that to, you know, he realized that that was how you bring people together at the holidays because he couldn't afford to go home. And he's realized, too, that, that transportation is an issue. You know, it's one thing to give away the trees, but people have to get it home. <laughs> uh, and he started hearing about people who were trying to take them home on, on the bus. And so one man at one point offered his pickup truck just to help people get them to their own places. Well, and can I just say, I, I love the idea that people are saying thank you by sending pictures of their decorated trees. You know, best way to say thank you, a show why you're thankful, not just say the words. I'm gonna go home That's with the my tree now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the National for this Wednesday, December 12th. Good night. Good night. Bye.